see you here this morning. Let's look at our announcements on the back of the bulletin. Uh, we have our Christmas Eve service, candlelight service, on at 7.30 on Tuesday night. And then next Sunday, we're going to have a hymn sing during worship. It's the fifth Sunday. And on the fifth Sunday, remember, we always try to do a hymn sing. So this will be a chance for you to sing all those Christmas songs that we didn't get to sing already. So um, plan to come and let's have as many people as we can singing Christmas carols next week. And then our Advent study, because of the day after Christmas being the normal day for our Advent study, we postponed it to um, December 30th, which is a Monday. So um, 1 o'clock on Monday, December 30th for our last Advent study. Are there other announcements? Sure. Yes. Uh, Being one city. is indeed so fortunate to have three wonderful employees and we appreciate all three of them. Uh, we pass the hat and thus three gift certificates are a small token of the esteem that we all have for the three employees. So enjoy and a Merry Christmas from BUMC. This is for Reverend, we've already given it to um, Nelson Matthews, he has received his. And this is for Reverend Meisel. Thank you, Meisel. Meisel. And this is for Joseph, who's a wonderful man. <laughs> For the awareness of God's loving gift to us, the gift of the Christ child. Thanks be to God, who again reminds us of God's eternal love. Open our hearts, O oh Lord, to receive your blessed gift. Amen. And let us join in singing. 
Love Came Down at Christmas, number 242 in the hymnal and on the screen. <laughs>
Gail will be leading our children this morning. Our child. <laughs> Are you thrilled? Okay, well, if you're not, I am. <laughs> Come here. We have some audience participation work to do today. So I'm going to ask you a, a kind of question that I'm hoping you know the answer to. What's your name? Ajax. Are you sure about that, right? What's your sister's name? Eris. Are you sure about that, too, right? Okay. I'm just busting on you, okay? Imagine I do this for, for real all day. This child's name. It's Jesus. You're right. You're, you're doing fine. <laughs> you're, you're all. You're good. Okay. Okay. Hey, do this for a living. Okay. All right. So, Jesus. That's his name. You know that, right? But did you know that he has another name? Actually, two other names. Do you, Do you think you know what one of them is? So that's a no, right? Okay, that's cool. I didn't know either until I got this piece of paper from the pastor, so I'm actually kind of working on some notes here. So what happened is Jesus actually has a Hebrew name, a Hebrew name and I'm probably not going to pronounce this right, but it's Yeshua, which actually means Jesus in Hebrew. And it's a very good <coughs> name. And that's what Mary and Joseph decided to name him. But... When Matthew was writing his book in the Bible, he was looking back. I'm going to sit down next to you. When he was looking back at Isaiah, and he was reading Isaiah, and he said, hey, there's going to be a baby that's going to come to two very special people, and his name's supposed to be Emmanuel. So he read that, and he said, I'm going to call Jesus Emmanuel in my book. So actually, Jesus has three names. Can you say it with me? Sure you can. Jesus. Yeshua. Yeshua. Emmanuel. Emmanuel. You did awesome. If you win Jeopardy, will you split the winnings with me? I got a witness, too. All right, you have a great day and a great school vacation. I shall. I shall, too. Thank you. See you, Pete.
Hale for Children's Time and the choir for their anthem. And now we will have our first scripture reading. <clears throat> our first scripture reading is from Isaiah 7, 10 through 16. This is another of the many Old Testament prophecies interpreted by the church as predictions of the Messiah. Originally, it was no more than a promise to uh, Ahaz, the king of Judah, in the late 7th century BC, that God would deliver his kingdom from imminent danger of invasion. <clears throat> Matthew 1, verse 22 and 23, gave the early Christian church the popular interpretation that the sign of a young woman bearing a son to be named Emmanuel was a specific reference to the birth of Jesus. And so goes the reading. Again, the Lord spoke to Ahaz, saying, Ask the sign of the Lord, of your, the Lord your God. Let it be deep as Sheol, or high as heaven. But Ahaz said, I will not ask, and I will not put the Lord to the test. Then Isaiah said, Hear then, O house of David. Is it too little for you to weary mortals, that you weary my God also? Therefore the Lord himself will give you a son. Look, the young woman is with the child, and shall bear a son, and shall name him Emmanuel. He shall eat curds and honey by the time he knows how to refuse the evil and choose the good. For before the child knows how to refuse the evil and choose the good, the land before whose two kings you are in dread will be deserted. May God bless this reading from the prophet Isaiah. Let's stand and sing our next hymn, Joseph, Dearest Joseph Mine, number 2099, in the faith of
Jesus the Messiah took place in this way. When his mother had been engaged to Joseph, but before they lived together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. Her husband Joseph, being a righteous man and unwilling to expose her to public disgrace, planned to dismiss her quietly. But just when he had resolved to do this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you are to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet. Look, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall name him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. When Joseph awoke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took her as his wife, but had no marital relations with her until she had born a son, and he named him Jesus. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. Let us be in prayer. O Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. This morning I want to share uh, an imaginary version of Joseph and how he came to have this dream. This was written by one of my colleagues, the Reverend Bill Trench, who is a pastor in Rhode Island. Long before the heavenly host set the sky dancing for the startled shepherds, long before the bright star guided the wise men from the east, there was another story. If we accept the traditional chronology, then it is not a story for December, but it is a Christmas story just the same. I want to explore that story with you this morning. So let your imaginations go back across the centuries to Nazareth in Galilee to a carpenter shop. It is early summer. The evening stars have just come out and there is a warm breeze. Joseph has just finished his supper. These last few weeks, he had been working later than usual. As he prepares for bed, Joseph has been thinking, thinking about Mary. It seems he has always been thinking about Mary, and since she has been away, his thoughts have taken on a new urgency. Is she too young for him? She is so full of life and adventure. There is starlight in her beautiful dark eyes. Everyone loves Mary, and when she agreed to marry him, it was the happiest day of his life. But now he wonders, where, where is she anyway? Why did she have to go visit Elizabeth? And why did she have to stay so long? Her cousin is having a baby. The cousins have babies all the time. Elizabeth is so much older. What could they possibly have in common? If only she were here. The questions and thoughts jumbled together in his mind. The smell of fresh cut cedar fills the room. It is, a com it is comfortable and, and reassuring. Joseph has always been most at home with his wood. Not a conversationalist. Not one to try to impress others with his wit or wisdom. But he is solid like the wood and dependable. He is a just man. Will that be enough for Mary? Lately, Joseph has been wondering. He is uneasy. But everyone has second thoughts, he tells himself. Marriage is a big step. It is normal to have doubts. He brushes the sod up off of his arms and puts out the lamp. He goes over to lie down. I will pray about this, he tells himself. I will pray about this, and perhaps God will direct me. So he lies there, and the moonlight shines through the window. It is just bright enough that he can see tiny specks of sawdust 
floating in the breeze above his workbench. Joseph tries to pray, and he tries to sleep. He will gladly take whichever will come first. And a dream fall forms almost before he falls asleep. It is as clear and real as anything that ever happened to him. He's in the market buying flour, and behind him, just over his shoulder, he can hear a conversation between two women. One of them is Anna. Joseph has never really met her, but he knows that she is a friend of Mary's mother. Isn't it a shame, Anna says. Yes, says her friend, and Mary is so young. And in his dream, he hears them saying what he himself has been afraid to let himself think. That Mary is too young to be married, at least she is too young for him. He knows the women would not say these things if they did not also believe that it is not a good match. That he was too old for her, and Mary could do better. These thoughts are troubling him. Joseph tosses in his sleep. But the dream moves on and he hears more. At first, says Anna, speaking in low tones, I didn't want to believe it myself. But why else would she go away? I wonder what poor Joseph is going to do. These words sink in slowly. Poor Joseph. Why? Poor Joseph, he asks himself. I thought they were worried about Mary. And then the dream fades as the answer forms in his mind like sawdust filling up the cracks, and he sits up in bed. He can feel the cold sweat on his back, and the warm breeze makes him shiver. Is it a dream or a memory? Is that the truth? Is that why Mary went away? He slumps forward and puts his hand on his knees. The dream has set him on a line of thought which he cannot shake. Of course, that's it. Mary is with child. It can't be, but it is. Joseph climbs out of bed and pulls on his robe. He walks over to the window and looks out on his little city, so still in the moonlight. Down the street, he can see the edge of the marketplace, and he flinches involuntarily to think that his name is now the punchline and crude jokes. Mary is with child, and as a just man, Joseph realizes he has two options in divorcing her. He can divorce her publicly and clear his name at the expense of further humiliation, or he can break off the, he can break it off divorce her privately, and try to make it easy for her. Whose child is it? Why didn't she say something before she left, he wonders. It is a sad business, but even in his anger and embarrassment, he knew that public humiliation would solve nothing. He resolved to do what had to be done quietly and compassionately as possible. He loved her. He turned to go back to bed, and suddenly it hit him. This was a dream, for heaven's sakes. Nothing but a dream, and he was acting as if it were real. He was letting his anxiety get the better of him. No one was talking about him in the marketplace. It was just a dream. Mary wasn't with child. What a crazy idea. Tomorrow he would send word to Mary to come home again, and everything would be all right. Certain now that he can finally get some sleep, Joseph went back to bed and closed his eyes. And another dream formed almost before he could fall asleep. And again, it is as clear and real as anything that ever happened to him. There was an angel, and like most Jews of his day, Joseph didn't believe in angels. And the angel was speaking to him. This was not a good sign because Jews, and uh, like most Jews of his day, Joseph didn't believe in angels. He rolled over and covered his head and tried to escape into a deeper sleep. 
but the angel continued to speak until the voice seemed to echo off the walls of his room. It is true, said the angel, Mary is with child, and you must marry her anyway. For the child she is carrying is to be called Jesus, because he will be savior of his people. Jesus comes completely awake and rolls out of bed again. The moon is gone, and the first gray light of dawn is sifting into the room. He feels the comfort of familiar things in a familiar place, but the feeling is short-lived. And he feels the weight of certain knowledge that his dream was real. Mary is with child. How will he face the old men at the gate? What will he tell the rabbi? How will he cope with the whisperings of the women in the marketplace? In the first light of dawn, Joseph cannot answer these questions, but he knows with painful certainty that love must be at the center of the law. He loves God, and he loves Mary, and he will stand by his beloved no matter the cost. He will take her as his wife. The author of the Gospel of Matthew says that Joseph was a righteous man. He was offended by what had happened, for, for who are the righteous if they are not offended by unrighteousness? In Nazareth, they were clear about these things. Never mind that Joseph and Mary were engaged to be married or already married is unclear according to the scriptures. In Galilee, they called it adultery. In our time, for many people, adultery has become little more than a quaint term for what we moderns call fooling around. But Joseph was not one of them. Right and wrong, justice and injustice, every jot and tittle of the law mattered to Joseph. So he was caught between loving the Torah, the Hebrew scriptures, and loving Mary. His first impulse was to divorce Mary privately in order that she should not suffer, suffer shame or public humiliation. That's what most righteous men would have done. But God intervened with him, just as God intervened with Mary. William H. Willimon, a retired United Methodist bishop, reminds us that Jesus asked his disciples to exceed in righteousness. And Willimon suggests that Joseph is the first example of this new righteousness. And Dietrich Bonhoeffer in his book Ethics describes this new kind of righteousness as going beyond the anxious concern for impeccable behavior to a willingness to bear the guilt of others, a willingness to suffer ridicule for others. And again, Joseph's righteousness followed that kind of ethic. His righteousness was also excessive in that it was so quiet that he didn't show off his righteousness at Mary's expense. Mary and Elizabeth sing of the Lord's blessings. But Joseph is silent. His witness is that he does more than he says. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said that righteousness should not call attention to himself, should not pat itself on the back or trumpet its arrival. To be righteous is to do what God wants, quietly, obediently, no matter the embarrassment. Through Joseph and Mary, Matthew's Gospel also shows us that from the moment of conception, Jesus had the effect of causing righteous people to rethink their righteousness. All values were turned upside down. Everything had to be reconsidered. For every righteous person, like Simeon or Elizabeth or Zechariah, for whom the baby Jesus was the answer to prayer, there was also a righteous person like Joseph, 
for whom this new life was an embarrassment, requiring a quiet and difficult rethinking of everything that gives meaning to life. If we are serious about our faith, then Jesus will continue to have the same effect on us, making us rethink our faith. Thank God that Joseph was selected to be Jesus' earthly father. Jesus spoke about God in terms of father, and that speaks volumes about the kind of father that Joseph was. Joseph was a righteous man, but he put love at the center of the law. Joseph loved enough to open his heart to the possibility that God was working in a strange new way. And thus it was that the incarnate love of God became a reality even before Jesus was born. If we, like Joseph, are open to the possibility that God is working in our lives in ways that we never imagined, we just might discover a love that is greater than anything we have ever known. Amen. For our pastoral prayer this morning, there is a uh, so kind of like a bidding prayer, and there will be a response. I'll say, Oh God, whose advent is near, and then you will reply, Hear us and renew us with your love. Let us pray. Mighty one whose name is holy, fill your church in all places with wonder at your mighty deeds that we may practice your will, sing your praise, and answer your constant calling. O God, whose advent is near, hear us and we know what you do our law. Humble the nations with the compassion you show to the poor and lowly, that with softened hearts, world leaders may turn from war and embrace the way of justice you have shown us in Jesus Christ. O God, whose advent is near, hear us and renew us in your love. Give peace to those who are too busy, who are hurting emotionally, who are unable to hear your message of peace and hope and joy and love. Embrace us, O God, whose advent is near. Hear us and renew us. And we pray that you would speak a word of hope to those who suffer the pain of abuse, those who are burdened with illnesses, especially for Elaine Hickey. And we pray for those we have lost this past week, for the family of Donald Lilly and the family of Lou Batchelder. Use us. O oh God, to lift up the lowly and proclaim a song of hope to all in need. We also pray for those we have named in our hearts, especially the lost and forgotten. O oh God, whose advent is near, as we have brought our concerns to you in prayer, Remind us again that you hold each and every one of us gently and lovingly in your constant care. We thank you for your love and ask these things in the name of the one whom you sent to heal and free us, Jesus, the one who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. We will now receive our morning offering. Will the ushers please come forward?
begin is Star Child, number 2095 in the basement. Amen. Amen. And now let us form a circle to sing, Let There Be Peace on Earth. 